Hey, how's it going? The days are ticking by and we are fastly approaching Brandon Sanderson's fourth installment into the Stormlight Archive series, Rhythm of War. I am so excited for this book, but I realize that we have read over 1.2 million words in the Stormlight Archive so far. And that's not including all the other books in the Cosmere, as well as all of the countless times that Brandon Sanderson has said something at some random signing that he attended. Like you're trying to tell me that we know some of the confirmed sleepless sightings because one time in Omaha in 2017, while Brandon Sanderson was signing his like children's spooky library book series, he just decided to share that information with us? How am I supposed to keep all this straight, Brandon? Initially, I wanted to create a nice primer video going into Rhythm of War, all the things that you might not know but need to know, but I I had a lot of difficulty trying to parse out the best way to do that. There's just so much information. And I know that I had already released a video for the month of November for a book, but I've decided that for this month, we're going all in. We're going deep into Brandon Sanderson. Sadly, we're gonna have to push the Wizards back to December. I still got them, I'm still reading. Don't worry, I'm excited to talk about those books. These videos are intended for people who have already read the Stormlight Archive up to and including Oathbringer. I wanna be able to pull all of the information that I normally have sitting up in 35,000 Wikipedia tabs so that you don't have have to do that while you're reading a book. This might be information you've already heard. This might be information that you think is very common knowledge. I just want to put a lot of it in one place. This first part is going to be a slight breakdown of the magic system and the Knights Radiant and the Heralds. It's going to be an opportunity to connect some dots, make some theories, and just overall get a better understanding of how the Knights Radiant work. We're going to be pulling canon information from the Stormlight Archive, other books in the Cosmere, the Q&As that Brandon Sanderson has done throughout the years, and last but not least, the hip, fun, trendy, BuzzFeed, what Knights Radiant Order are you quiz? Because all of the breakdowns for each of the Knights Radiant Orders were written by Brandon Sanderson, and so all of that explanation and fun trivia is also canon. And of course, this is going to be talking about the three Stormlight Archive books in depth. It's going to be mentioning aspects of other books in the Cosmere series like Mistborn. And I'm also going to have some expectation that you've read the Stormlight Archive books. I'm gonna hope that you generally know what Spren are and what Shard Plate is. Okay, cool, still with me? We're going? Good. So let's start quickly with the origins of magic on Roshar. Roshar has three gods. Now, they aren't gods, they're something called shards, but explaining what shards are in the larger scheme of things is just a lot. And for understanding surge binding, it's not super important. So all you gotta know, these three gods, they're shards. There are three of them. Their names, Honor, Odium, Cultivation. A long time ago, Honor walked up to a couple of dudes and gave him some swords. These swords are now known as the Honor Blades, and they can bestow abilities of surge binding onto anyone who wields them. Honor also provided a connection between him and these 10 men and women that gave them so much power they have transcended beyond humanity. These 10 are known as the Heralds. The spread of the world saw the powers given to the Heralds and they began to mimic them. By bonding with a sentient being, they could bestow the powers of surge binding onto them. The differences between the Heralds and these surge binders was that the Heralds possessed the power of rebirth and they also held access to power that no non-Herald surge binder could ever wish to obtain. But still, some of the Heralds feared the powers that these new surge binders had. There were some powers that they were able to achieve that even the Heralds could not. And so they forced the immortal words onto them. These ideals and oaths served as restraints to help guide and control the way the new newly formed Knights Radiant would act. Once they have sworn the first oath, they become a member of the Knights Radiant. Ten Heralds, ten Radiant Orders, and each Knight Radiant Order had five ideals to swear. While the first ideal for every order was the same, the next four are unique to each order. And the Order of Lightweavers don't swear ideals past the first. Each ideal is like a level up in the order, and they are bestowed powers as they reach higher levels. And it seems very much so that it was the power level that they are able to unlock at the fifth ideal that the Heralds were scared of. Surge Binders, both through a bond with a spren or through an honor blade have a combination of two of the ten surges which they draw their powers from. How each of the knight's radiant orders use these powers in conjunction with each other can seem to change how any given surge works, but there are some surges that seem to work pretty uniformly across the knight's radiant that share them. Now there are a few concepts of the Cosmere magic system as a whole that I think are very important to touch on in order for you to have a better understanding of how the magic on Roshar works. These concepts are investiture, resonance, savantism, and connection with a capital C. Investiture is the underlying energy that empowers all magic systems in the Cosmere. When a Surge Binder inhales Stormlight, they are taking in Investiture. Shard Plate and Shard Blades are invested objects. Now, Resonance occurs when an individual has access to more than one type of invested art or Surge. Both the Knights Radiant and the Heralds have access to two Surges each, so they experience Resonance. They gain these secondary effects because of the way that their Surges interact with each other. Now, these effects can be very minor. You can see some minor Resonance effects with Twin borns in Mistborn, but the resonance effects on Roshar are widely accepted to be way more extreme. They are, however, still meant to be seen less as a new power 
and more is this side effect kind of thing. An effect that in some cases can change the way that the base power functions. The soul casters on Roshar, they're an example of magic users that do not experience resonance. A soul caster on the planet Roshar, on the continent Roshar, using a soul caster to soul cast grain. You see, Brandon, this is what you do to me. You, you start by naming things Mraes and Braze and Raze, and then you name the planet Roshar, and then you name the continent Roshar. My head just hurts, Brandon. Please, stop. But anyway, the soul casters are only using one surge, so they do not experience the effects of resonance. They do, however, experience the effects of savantism. Savantism occurs when somebody uses an investiture-related ability so much that it changes their physiology. This is because as one spirit becomes more and more infused with investiture, that person becomes closer to the spiritual realm. So what the heck does that mean? It means they can use their powers more efficiently, or they can perform the magic of that world, like burning metal in Mistborn, significantly faster. But this savantism can also manifest itself in more noticeable physical ways. We've seen soul casters that are slowly turning to stone or smoke, or they have plants growing growing on them because of the type of soul casting that they are performing consistently day in and day out. But Radiants do not experience the negative sides of Savantism. This is due to the bond with their spren, known as the Nahel bond, and it is potentially a part of the reason why the Heralds feared these Surge Binders so much. They could reach higher levels of infused investiture and become closer to the spiritual realm without experiencing as many of the negative side effects. Connection involves the spiritual realm. There's a lot going on in the spirit realm, and while it's not all super critical to know, it is important that you understand that connection is a very powerful thing in the Cosmere. The Nahel bond is an example of connection working. Shard blades bonding to a user is an example of a form of connection. Connection is really important, even if it sounds really ethereal and not like it means any specific thing. In the Cosmere, it does. Now that we've got some of the Cosmere fundamentals out of the way, let's start talking about the Knight's Radiant. Let's dive into it. The First Order is the Order of Windrunners. Their patron is Jezrian, Herald of Kings, who after abandoning the Oath Pack, slowly started losing his mind and ultimately went crazy. He became a beggar in Kolinar and became Dalinar's good old drinking buddy. At the end of Oathbringer, we see him get killed by Moash, and based on the reactions from some of the characters, I don't think he's coming back, Chief. Windrunners form the Nahel Bond with Honor Spren. And to get a better idea of the Knight's Radiant Orders, I'm just going to read word for word what Brandon Sanderson has on this BuzzFeed quiz, because it gives us a lot of information both on the types of people they were, on the general feel of how their ideals are going to be sworn. The Windrunners' oaths are themed towards protection, particularly defending innocents or those who are unable to protect themselves. The Windrunners tend to attract big sibling types, who seek to protect the defenseless but also enjoy the action and fighting for what they believe in. They're primarily scouts, though they often work as special forces groups able to deliver teams of radiance behind enemy lines for secret missions. They tend to be the most like conventional soldiers, believing in structures of command, team dynamics, and the importance of squads of brothers and sisters. They often have larger numbers of squires than other orders and focus more than any other order on mastering their weapons. The Windrunners have the surges of adhesion and gravitation. These come to us in the book in the forms of lashings. A full lashing is adhesion, able to stick things to other things until stormlight runs out. And basic and reverse lashings are gravitation, able to control which way gravity is pulling things. The Windrunners resonance is their ability to have so many squires, their ability to draw people to themselves. The current known Windrunners are Kaladin, Teft, and Lopin, who have all sworn the third ideal. Then there's Drahi and Scar, who have sworn the second ideal and are close to the third. And then the rest of Bridge 4 and Bridge 13 are all squires for the Windrunners. It is expected that Kaladin's going to swear the fourth ideal in this book. He was so close in Oathbringer, I think it would be really weird if he didn't swear his fourth ideal in Rhythm of War. It is really hard to compare the time progression between the fourth and third ideals. We know that for Skybreakers, sometimes it could take 30, 40, 50 years to get to the fourth ideal. But it seems for Kaladin, it's happened way faster. And while we don't know exactly what the fourth ideal is for Windrunners, we can assume a few things about it. It's hinted in an epigraph that this ideal might have to do with not helping people. My best guess for Kaladin is that he's going to have to learn how to prioritize himself over saving everyone. And this is because a lot of the time, if you're going to sacrifice yourself to save any individual, you might be hurting the world as a whole. If you are the person that is most capable of doing something and you decide to throw yourself in front of a train to save a single person who's not going to be able to do anything nearly as powerful as you, you're actually doing the wrong thing. And I think that that is what Kaladin has to learn here. This would be a pretty good mirror to an event that we saw way early on in the Stormlight Archive, where, where Kaladin is still at home with his dad Liren. When Bright Lord Rashon and his son Relir show up, wounded from a hunt that they went on, Liren determines that Relir's injuries are fatal and that he's going to die. And despite Bright Lord Rashon's requests, he ignores them and helps Rashon and lets his son die. Knowing what injuries to prioritize and whose life to save 
is something that Lyran really tries to put into Kaladin's head. And I think that that narrative mirror we might potentially see in the future for Kaladin, that he's going to have to let someone die. Hell, he might let his dad die. And that's extreme sad irony. My boy Kaladin's just gonna be perpetually stuck in sad boy hours without how many bad events keep happening to him. It just breaks my heart. Anyway, it's also expected that the fourth ideal will grant shard plate to the user. We're going to assume that this shard plate doesn't interfere with surge binding like normal shard plate does. Next up, we've got the Skybreakers. Their patron is Nail or Nalan. Now, Nail's still a pretty big player in this world. I'm sure you've run into him at the grocery store once or twice. He is a herald with an above average IQ because he realized that he should join the Knights Radiant. He should expand his powers a bit by bonding with a spren. He has maintained the order of the Skybreakers and they are the only order to not have abandoned their oaths and they continue to act to this day. He's also the only known Skybreaker to have reached the fifth ideal in centuries. Skybreakers form a bond with the High Spren. And what does Brandon got to say about him? Skybreaker oaths are themed towards justice, fighting for causes, and enforcing social rules. They generally reinforce the importance of moral codes, legal structures, and similar boundaries that protect civilization. The Skybreakers were the enforcers of the Knights Radiant, often tasked with keeping the peace, policing the other orders, and making certain that dangerous or dark forces in the world were contained. This sometimes gave them a bad reputation among the more free-thinking orders of the Knights, but the Skybreakers, at their best, were not merciless. They were the ones who believed that nobody, not even the Radiant should be above being questioned. They were the ones that did the sometimes tough job of making certain that other orders didn't abuse their powers to become tyrants, as the Skybreakers saw those with power could easily oppress those who had none. They tend to attract those who believe in the importance of legal code, those who have strong moral codes of their own, and those who think the best defense against anarchy are things like patriotism, moral fiber, and rules to govern behavior. Note that the current incarnation, led by Harold Nail in this madness, is more rigid than the ancient order, which understood that the law is not perfect, but instead represented an ideal to try and reach over time. Anyone believing in finding true justice, in defending the innocent, and in punishing the guilty would be welcome in the order. A majority of the Skybreakers in Stormlight Archive have sided with the natural residents of Roshar, the Parsh, which means that they are also siding with Odium in this war. The Knights Radiant only have a singular Skybreaker. That's my man Seth. Let's go. He knows what's up. He's wise to it. The Skybreakers have the surges of gravitation and division. While we don't know what all of their powers are, they do gain the basic lashings of gravitation like Windrunners do. We know that the surge of division generally allows them to destroy or degrade things around them, but they don't even unlock that surge until the third ideal is spoken. And this is something that is rare among the orders, and they normally don't lock a surge behind one of the ideals. It's also in lore that Skybreakers have this innate ability to be able to separate the innocent from the guilty, though through word of Brandon, this has been confirmed to not be the same thing as a resonance, and so it might just be lore being exaggerated as time has gone on. The third ideal of the Skybreakers is the highest that most Skybreakers will ever swear. The fourth ideal for the Skybreakers is a crusade that they must go on, and once they complete that crusade, they will have achieved the fourth ideal, becoming Master Skybreakers. Only Masters of the fourth ideal or higher are able to take on Squires, unlike the Windrunners where Kaladin is only of the third ideal and he's taken on a ton of Squires. The fifth ideal requires a Skybreaker to swear an oath to become the personification of law and order, though this is up for interpretation what it actually means. It's clear that you aren't a true personification of what actual law and order means because Nail has already sworn the fifth ideal. He admits that because of his twisted mind, he isn't the true personification of it. He just tries his best. Nail has also said that he's going to be returning to teach Seth how to use his division surge, which let's get an appreciation post for Nail out here. Like he's on the opposite side. He goes, this is where I'm going. And Seth goes, well, I'm going the other way. And Nail goes, I respect that. I'm still going to teach you. Teacher of the year award, dude. And I think that that respect that Nail has for people making the right decision, as long as he gives them the tools that they need to be able to make that decision, will lead to a few more Skybreakers possibly coming over to the side of the Knights Radiant. The Order of the Dustbringers hate their name. They feel it's too close to Voidbringer and would rather be called Releasers. Their herald is Shauna Rock, and although we haven't consciously seen her in the story yet, it is confirmed that she is still alive and that at least one of the characters, knowingly or not, has run into her in the world. Dustbringers form a Nahel bond with Ash Spren. Most Ash Spren are still mad at humanity for letting a lot of them die during the Desolations and are pretty uninterested in reforming the Knights Radiant, so there are very few Dustbringers bringers around, that we do have confirmation from Brandon Sanderson that we will be seeing more Dustbringers in Rhythm of War. Dustbringers' odes were themed towards responsibility. They were led to understand that the powers they used needed to be properly channeled, much as their own desires and wills needed to properly form and shape. As a Dustbringer moved through the oaths, they were taught greater powers of destruction and are one of the only orders where the abilities weren't all available at the beginning, but instead were delivered slowly as they made the proper oaths. Each oath led to a greater understanding of power, the nature of 
of holding it and the associated responsibilities. They believe the great power requires a strong will to control it. They often attract tinkerers who like to dig down into the shape and soul of a thing, break it, and see what makes it work. However, their oaths are themes toward control, that they need to be able to control, contain, and channel the terrible power inside of them. They tend to object to those who focus only on their destructive sides, as they argue that in order to create, one must understand the pieces of the thing that they are trying to make. They don't see themselves as being about destruction, though their powers are the most destructive of any order in the Knights Radiant. They instead see their nature as being about control, precision, and understanding. In the Knights Radiant, they tend to act as the equivalent of artillery in a modern army. If you want a large swath of land destroyed or burned, you call in the Dustbringers. However, they are also used as sappers, engineers, and strategists. They attract anyone who likes to take things apart, who likes to know how things work. They also attract those who are a little foolhardy at times, brave soldiers who see themselves as containing and controlling terrible destruction so it won't get out of hand and hurt innocents. There's only one currently known Dustbringer, and that's Malata, who is a member of Taravangian's diagram team. Dustbringers have the surges of division and abrasion. We have seen Malata use division to engrave a design into a piece of wood by burning it. And while we haven't seen her use abrasion yet, we do know of a Dustbringer who is able to use abrasion to drop their friction and run through the pier lake unimpeded. We have seen in a vision from Dalinar that a single Dustbringer can have dozens of squires. And Dustbringers are actually the first mentioned order in the books. So I'm really excited to see what more we're going to see for Dustbringers in Rhythm of War. Next, we got the Slippy Slidey Order of the Edge Dancers. Their patron herald is Videl, whose status is currently unknown to us. Edge Dancers bond with Cultivation Spren. Edge Dancer oaths are themed around remembering the ordinary people of the world, those who aren't powerful generals or radiants. Too often, the actions of the powerful have terrible effects on the people with no voice, and the Edge Dancers consider it their solemn duty to remember that the people are the ones who they truly serve. The Edge Dancers are known as being caring and graceful. Among the Knights Radiant, they see it as their duty to care for the people who are often less interested in war than they are about trying to improve the daily lives of the common folk. Often, a mid-sized town would have an edge dancer or two on permanent assignment where they'd use regrowth to provide healing and work for the common good of the town. Edge dancers tend to be among the more of the religious of the Radiants and are the order where you're most likely to find former religious leaders who end up bonding with Spren. During wartime, they often act as mobile medics, eschewing actual combat to heal or pull out the wounded or those trapped in terrible situations. However, there are some renowned for their graceful and skilled prowess in combat, occasionally used as scouts or special forces troops in conjunction with a team of Windrunners or Skybreakers. One should never assume that Edge Dancers are in any way base just because they often ignore high society. They are renowned as some of the most refined and graceful of the Radiants. One of the most on-brand things for everyone involved is one of the drawer gems that they find in Urethiru for Edge Dancers. And the quote reads, the Edge Dancers are too busy relocating the tower servants and farmers to send a representative to record their thoughts in these gemstones. I'll do it for them then. They are the ones who will be most displaced by this decision. The Radiance will be taken in by nations, but what of all these people now without homes? And that was written by a stone word who sacrificed his own opportunity to write something down to help out his friends, the Edge Dancers. <laughs> Another example of on-brand edge dancer style is when Lyft goes into the vision with Dalinar and they run into Odium. Lyft asks, what's up his butt? And while this is, you know, Lyft being Lyft, on some level, the core question is, how did that human vessel get to be the way it is now? Lyft is acknowledging the mortality. So, you know, classic edge dancer curiosities and worries. An edge dancer has the surges of adhesion and progression. Progression allows for them to make objects grow at a faster rate, as well as heal. We aren't quite sure though, what the extent of this healing is, though it is expected that they would be able to heal a shard blade wound. The surge of abrasion allows them to manipulate friction, letting them slip and slide wherever they want, making themselves hard to grab, making themselves skate across the ground. They have been described to ride the thinnest of ropes, dance across rooftops, and move through a battlefield like a ribbon in the wind. The only edge dancer we currently know of is Lyft. And because of Lyft's mm, other problems, it's super difficult to say what traits are edge dancer and what traits are Lyft. We do know for a fact that her stormlight production is an aspect of Lyft and not an aspect of being an edge dancer. Now here's where we get to the part where we aren't quite sure what's going on. In the Lyft novella, she talks to a street urchin in some kind of slang, and when Windle her spren asks her about it, she says that those words just felt right. And this is showcasing the resonance of the edge dancers, their ability to slip in and have a conversation and fit in with anyone. They can talk with the lowest of society, but then go to a royal gala and end up looking like the most royal person there, which is why they are perceived as so noble. However, her ability to have this conversation without actually knowing the slang could be because she is partially in the cognitive realm and is able to see the soul of this person and better understand what they are saying. Most often language tends to be a spiritual realm thing. We see Dalinar do this with spiritual adhesion, allowing him to converse with people in languages that he doesn't understand. Language in general has a lot to do with connection. We see this in the Mistborn series and we can assume that Lyft might be doing that instead. She has a ton of paths that could lead her to this ability and we aren't quite sure which one is the correct one. I'm super interested to see more of Lyft in Rhythm of War. I don't think some people 
people like her, but I really enjoy all of her interactions. I hope we get to see her get a better lock on her powers, and perhaps we can see a little, I don't know, a little a little training arc, a little mentor student kind of thing going on with her and Seth. It's been revealed that Seth trained with all of the honor blades in Shinovar, and so he is well versed in the skills of an edge dancer, and so it'd be, it'd be cool to see them pull out the ice skates and have a little bit of fun. Up next, we have the Order of the Truth Watchers. Their patron herald is Pylia, who may or may not be in Carbranth. There have been words of Brandon that have changed who was in Carbranth when Shalon and Yasna were there. It might have been Batar, it might have been Pylia, it might have been both. We're not quite sure. Truth Watchers form the Nahel bond with a spren that we don't yet have a name for. For two of the Truth Watcher characters that we've seen, their spren are like a shimmer of light on a surface. But Gliss, Renarin's spren, has been corrupted by Sia Anat, and it looks like a red crystalline thing with light dripping off upwards from it. Truth Watcher oaths are themed around seeking to find ultimate truth and sharing it. They are very concerned with knowledge and the proper exploitation of it. Note that this should not be confused with the Lightweavers whose oaths are themed towards personal truths about themselves, said for reasons of self-actualization. Truth Watchers are more concerned with the fundamental truths of the universe, and whether or not those in power are being truthful with the people they lead. The Truth Watchers are seen as quiet, largely known as the most scholarly order of the Knights Radiant. They tend to attract scientists primarily, but also scholars or thinkers of all types. This extends to some who might not normally be known as scholarly, but instead as someone who often is consumed by their own thoughts. In general, they tend to be reserved, particularly in person, though a small minority of Truth Watchers are greatly concerned with the actions of the powerful and might be likened to investigative reporters. These make their opinions known loudly and forcefully, particularly if they think someone in power is abusive using that power or lying about fundamental truth. Note that, as with all Knights Radiant, there is a great disagreement within the Order about what is the truth. However, Truth Watchers tend to approach these discussions with enthusiasm, even if they generally prefer to write their opinions rather than speak them. Among the Knights Radiant, the Truth Watchers tend to be those who hold the knowledge and secrets of Surge Binding and are the ones to discover many of the newer advances in things like Fabrial technology. We have seen three Truth Watchers. Renarin, with his corrupt Spren, so it's pretty hard to say what's going on with him and what powers he has that are Spren related and what powers are corrupted related. There is Stump from the Edge Dancer novella, who is in the very early stages of being a Truth Watcher. And then we saw Yim, who Nail killed, who is on the path to becoming a Truth Watcher. Now, because Renarin is our main source of Truth Watcher information, similar to Lyft, it's really hard to differentiate the powers of the Truth Watcher and the powers of the person. Even his oaths seem to be different from the standard ones of being a Truth Watcher. We know for a fact that they have the surges of progression and illumination. Progression being that surge for healing and regrowth. Illumination is their other surge. And while Light Weavers use this surge for illusions, it's unknown how the Truth Watcher is going to use this. Renarin's future sight, we know for a fact to either be void binding or void binding adjacent. We also saw him absolutely destroy that Thunderclass. And whether that was his void powers or truth watcher powers, we're not sure. Renarin is also just like a really awesome character in general. Brandon Sanderson has clearly gone to some extent to mimic mental health problems in the real world in the Stormlight Archive, and I think he's done it really well. It's been stated that he is certainly on the autism spectrum, and in addition to that, he suffers from myoclonic seizures. These in tandem lead to people treating Renarin as mentally slow, when in reality he's just stuck in his head a lot and does a lot of thinking. He is also someone I think is suffering the most from gender roles on Alethkar. His pursuit of his own curiosities tend to be seen as a more feminine aspect, and he gets bullied a lot for this. All right, we're on one that we have a little bit more information on than some of the others, and that would be Lightweavers. Their patron herald is Shalash, who's been running around destroying all the likenesses of her in the world. Now, Shalash is one of our 10 flashback viewpoint characters. She will be the flashback character for one of the books in the second five. Now, we can confidently map the other nine flashback characters to the different orders. Nine out of 10 orders, and the only order left is Dustbringers. All I'm saying is, if Shalash even has one more brain cell than Nail, maybe, maybe she's gonna connect the dots that, hey, as a Herald who's been given two surges to command, maybe I should not swear into my own order and just power those up, but go to a different order and get two more surges. That's big brain. Lightweavers bond with Lyspren, though they are almost always referred to as cryptics. Lightweavers' oaths are an oddity, perhaps because their spren tend to be the oddest among all radiant spren. Instead of speaking specific words or even words along a certain theme, Lightweavers speak truths about themselves, things they must admit to themselves in order to progress as people. It is theorized that because Lightweavers live on the line between reality and fiction, it is important for them to be able to separate the real from the lie, and only with the proper ability to do so can they move forward. Lightweavers are the Radiants most interested in the arts, including all kinds of visual arts and theater. They range widely in personality from the quiet and introspective painter to the outgoing and gregarious stage performer with everything in between. What unites them tends to be a love of art, though there are some few who are more interested in intrigue, secrets, and espionage. 
They are the spies of the Knights Radiant and are often untrusted by others, such as the Stoic Skybreakers, for their love of subterfuge. They have a reputation for having looser morals than other orders, but the Lightweavers are quick to point out that their personal values are strong. They just don't feel the need to match what other more hardline orders tend to require. They can be vague with oaths, and many say that there is far more cultivation in them than honor. Others dispute this, saying that all orders have an equal mix, despite some spren naming themselves honor spren. Lightweavers tend to be free spirits, and many among their orders see the importance of entertainment, beauty, and art in the person's life, and strive to make sure that the world doesn't just live through the desolations, because mere survival isn't enough unless there is something to live for. The surges that Lightweavers have access to are soul casting and light weaving. Soul casting allows someone to partially or fully enter the cognitive realm to convince the sentience of an object to change its form. Some transformations are significantly more difficult than others. And that's that's what soul casting is at its core. You're just you're walking up to like the sentient being of air and you're going, be oil, please, and the air goes, make me, and then you go, please, and then it goes, okay, if you insist, and then it turns into oil. Light weaving, however, deals with illusions. It allows the manipulation of waves of sound or light, and it's extremely tied into the spiritual component. Creating these illusions requires a capital C connection with whatever you are trying to create, as well as an image of it in your mind. The Lightweavers potentially have way more than one resonance effect, but the one that we know for sure is that Lightweavers are able to mentally take a snapshot image of anything and then perfectly recreate it later. There are some hints that they might be able to minorly affect moods in some way, or that they could potentially combine their soul casting with their light weaving to create solid illusions, but these things we haven't seen in the world yet. We got a ton of known Lightweavers in the world, however. We got Shallan, we got Hoid, we got Vatha, who is Shallan, on Squire. Kaladin's brother Tian had a cryptid spren before, you know, he died. And Elikar was also about to swear the oaths with a cryptid spren. But, you know. Turns out trying to swear the Lightweaver oaths will just get you end up getting killed. Shallan, of course, is our main Lightweaver. And here's some crazy theory crafting for you. Shallan could have potentially sworn all of her ideals already, and she just doesn't remember it. Shallan is suffering from some big mental health trauma. And we know that when she was a kid, she had at least said some of the ideals to the pattern, but she just can't remember them. Brandon Sanderson has said that she has regressed a bit in her powers. But when we see her on the battlefield at the end of Oathbringer, Yasna takes note that she can see Shallan, Vale, and Radiant all standing there. And then when two of the illusions go away, it's in fact Radiant who is the real one who is currently in Shardplate. And that's a fourth ideal ability. So I think there's a lot still going on with Shallan that we don't quite know yet. Branton has come out and said that she is in fact bisexual, so that's kind of cool. I'm, I'm liking all this positive representation in Brandon Sanderson's books. Next, we have the Order of Else Callers. Their herald is Batar. Taravangian believes that Batar is hiding out in Carbranth, pretending to be an ardent named Dova. Brandon refuses to confirm this one way or the other, which means either, yeah, Dova is just Batar and he's just making us read and find out, or there's something a bit weirder happening there and it has to do with Dova, but she's not directly Batar. But what we do know about Dova is she's been focused on the death rattles that have been taking place on Roshar. Else Colors spawned with Ink Spren. Else Color Oaths, like those of the Light Weavers or Skybreakers, themed toward the individual. In this case, the theme is progress, becoming better with each oath, seeking to explore their true potential and reach it. Because of this, the order is open to many different types so long as they want to improve themselves. Thoughtful, careful, and cautious, the Else Callers are generally regarded as the wisest of the Radiants. They seek self-improvement and personal betterment in their lives, but aren't limited to one specific theme or set of ideals. This makes them one of the most open and welcoming orders, though they do tend to attract those who are less flamboyant. They have their share of scholars and often large number of theologians, but also attract those who are interested in leadership. They are good at encouraging others, but some are known to set their sights upon things they want and then seize them. In the Knights Radiant, they tend to be among the best tacticians and are logistical geniuses, aided in part by their abilities to create food and water for armies, but also their ability to move in and out of Shadesmar. Else scholars are very notably absent in the world, except for Yasna. We know that Ivory, the ink spren that Yasna bonded, named himself that because he sees himself as he's unusual or separate from his own kind. The reason why there aren't many else callers might be that the ink spren don't want to bond. Else callers have the surges of soul casting and else calling. Soul casting continues to act the same here as we've seen it in the past. Else calling allows them to transfer their body completely into and out of the cognitive realm by creating a small perpendicularity. However, it seems like it's harder to leave the cognitive realm than it is to enter. In ancient times, else calling was used to world hop and the else callers were seen as the liaisons between the royalty of the spren and the knight's radiant. I think it's pretty clear that if the Knights Radiant become a bigger player on the macro Cosmere board, it's going to be on the backs of Else Callers. Though we don't know for sure, Yasna might have shown off the Else Caller resonance when she is with Hoid. 
He acknowledges that she has a good sense of direction when she just picks away and starts walking towards the city. And it might be that the resonance for else callers is they have an internal GPS system, but we just don't have confirmation on that yet. Yasna might also already be on her fourth ideal. Early on in Oathbringer, she asks Shalon where her plate is when she mentions that she's a full light weaver. And then later during the Battle of Carbranth, we see geometric shapes disappearing as Adolin wraps the corner and sees Yasna after a man was just superhumanly thrown. So I think this could line up with how strong Yasna actually is here, because it does seem like she is the most advanced of the Knights Radiant right now. Will Shapers are what this book is all about, baby. We don't know much yet. Their patron herald is Kallik, who was last seen on the night of Gavilar's death. He, Nail, and Gavilar seem to be working together on something, but we're not quite sure what. Will Shapers bond with Light Spren, also known as Reachers. The Will Shapers believe strongly that all people should be free to make their own choices. Their odes are themes toward freedom and letting people be free to express themselves and make their own way in life. The Will Shapers have a reputation for attracting builders, craftspeople, and creators to the Radiant. However, while this aspect of them is accurate, the actual membership of the Order is far more varied. Their powers lend themselves to creation, true, but their oaths are focused on freedom and personal fulfillment. Many among the Will Shapers are warriors focused on freeing those who are captive and others who are focused on radical self-expression. The Will Shapers contain many gregarious and even flamboyant characters who make their own way, taking the path they choose. They are united through a love of building, but some consider the building of society to be more important than the building of structures. Among the Will Shapers, you will find those who dress very conservatively and those who are very daring and original styles. The common ground is that both agree that freedom to express who you are is the important part. Among the Radiants, they are generally focused on building, training, and making infrastructure. In war, they might be sent to a town to fortify it against an oncoming invasion. Before or in the wake of desolations, they would teach the people things like sanitization, bronze working, or other essentials. Anywhere you find someone resisting tyranny or oppression, you will often find a Will Shaper cheering them on. And a little fun fact, Will Shapers were the first of the orders that Brandon Sanderson made when working on this magic system. Not much is known about what these surges are going to be able to do. We know cohesion can alter the shape of a solid object, but we haven't yet seen it in practice. They have the surge of transportation, which means they can travel to and from the cognitive realm as well. And th this kind of ties into us knowing that they're big on freedom and exploration. We are aware that a will shaper was the one who mapped Amia. We know that Venli is going to be our will shaper point of view for this coming book. We have a ton of questions and like no answers. I can't wait. We don't know like anything about them. We don't know what their resonance is. We don't even know what their second or third ideals are yet. So I'm really excited to see what's going on in this book. Up next is Stonewards. Their patron is Talm, Herald of Soldiers. He was the herald that was left to suffer damnation while the other nine abandoned the Oath Pact. And despite his mind being turned to pudding all those years ago, he's still around. At the end of Oathbringer, he has a flash of sanity where he feels overjoyed at the opportunity that he was able to create for the humans. Big scary problem though is none of the good guys know that his honor blade's missing. Somewhere between his travel from Alethkar to the Shattered Plains, his honor blade was stolen and swapped out. We know this because the description of the blade changed and we know that it was going to be his honor blade and now it's not it's just a normal shard blade we do know for a fact that hoy doesn't have it but he was there with him for a little bit and we're not sure why it's just kind of spooky that that blade's out there somewhere stonewards form the nahel bond with a spren that we don't currently have a name for but we have seen in shadesmar they're the ones who look like stone and their skin cracks as they move stoneward oaths focus on team dynamics on learning to work with others and on being there for those who need them they put their interests of others before their own and will not bend their ideals for the sake of convenience stonewards are the infantry and ground troops of the radiance and are renowned as their finest soldiers, a title that, on occasion, the Windrunners dispute. They tend to attract those who are most interested in warfare, prowess with weapons, or athletics of any sort. They like a challenge, and in times of peace are seen engaging in and running various sporting events of both military and non-military nature. Many enjoy the outdoors, and you'll find exploration enthusiasts among them, as well as those who just like the fresh air. They tend to be known for their can-do attitudes and for taking on enormous projects, sometimes more than they can handle. However, most agree that the primary attribute of the Stonewards is their dependability. Though sometimes gregarious, they are never flighty. If a stoneward is your friend, they will be there for you, and that is a core tenant of their order, to be there when they are needed. Another key attribute is their ability to take a difficult situation with few resources and make something better of it. Though not known as inventors or creators, they are good at improvising solutions to problems in the moment. There are no currently known stonewards in the world. We know that their focus book is in the back five, and the flashback character for that book will be Talm, so we get no hints on if we're going to get any more stonewards even from that. So all we got to go on is some of the historical stonewards that we've seen. They have the surges of cohesion and tension. We've seen a guy in Dalinar's vision reshape a wall and run up it. We know that they can reshape things other than stone, but they can't reshape flesh or things that are even remotely invested. I love the idea of stone words. I like these golden retriever good boys, big old loyal friends willing to help you out, but also they're just trying to have some fun. They're just trying to play some sport, trying to trying to get out and do their job, get their reps in, dude. It reminds me of the workout squad.
squad from Mob Psycho 100 almost based on this description. So if they're anything like that, I'm super excited. Last but not least, we got them. They're right here. It's the big three. It's the Bondsmiths. Wah, wah, wah. The Bondsmiths Herald is Ishar, Herald of the Almighty and current God King of Takar. Ishar is often described as the founder of the Oath Pact as well as the Knights Radiant. He's been off in Takar fighting Emil over like a port city for six years and no one knows why. When he was approached by Dalinar to join the Alliance, he refused and then was like, give me your Ethereum. That's mine. I, that's I am God King. Give me. I want. Me crazy. So I, I'm not sure we're going to see anything useful from him for a while. Bondsmiths are a bit weird. They don't bond with a type of Spren, but they bond with one of three Spren. The Stormfather, the Night Watcher, and the Sibling. Bondsmith oaths are focused on unity, unification, and bringing others together. However, this is a loose theme as there are so few Bondsmiths and the three sources of their powers are so different in personality that the oaths can end up taking a variety of different shapes depending upon the situation. Anyone can become a Bondsmith, subject to persuading one of the three Spren who grant Bondsmith powers. Those powers tend to work differently from one Bondsmith to another, and even those surges they share with the other orders tend to work differently for Bondsmiths. The Bondsmiths are unusual in that there are never more than three full members. Historically, they worked to resolve disputes and help set up functioning government. Even though there can only ever be three full members, there were times that some Bondsmiths did take squires. Beyond that, many of the retinues that protected the Bondsmiths were considered members of the order, going so far as to even swear oaths, even though they didn't have a spren and never would. Some even called this the most pure form of being a Radiant, because these were oaths sworn not in the name of gaining powers, but simply for the good of the oaths themselves. Bondsmiths are generally the heart and soul of the Radiance, the most protected and highly regarded of the Orders, capable of doing incredible things with the nature of oaths, bonds, and power. The Order, including the aforementioned squires in attendance, tends to attract the peacemakers of the world, those who want to bring people together rather than divide them. Our current only standing Bondsmith, it's the big man on campus, the one, the only, the Blackthorn Dalinar who has bonded with the Stormfather. Bondsmiths have the surges of tension and adhesion, and while they do use adhesion in a similar way of the lashings that we've seen with Windrunners, Dalinar has also showcased his ability to use spiritual adhesion that manipulates spiritual forces as well. He can touch someone and form a spiritual big C connection with them, allowing him to temporarily speak their native language. And tension hasn't really been shown to us yet, so we don't know what it can do. We have seen that Bondsmiths can synergize with other Radiants to, to have a unique interaction between their surges. We saw Dalinar and Shallan combine to be able to create like a 3D image of what the Stormfather was able to see. They also have a minor parlor trick according to the Stormfather where he's able to just fix things, fix objects. He heals up a bunch of the stone structures when he meets with Queen Fen. Bondsmiths also typically don't get a shard blade because of the spren they bond with, though they can still somehow focus that power to be able to activate the oath gates and teleport places. Obviously we know where the Night Watcher and the Stormfather are, but we haven't seen anything to do with the sibling. We've read mentions of it. We know that a long time ago it retreated from humanity, though a Skybreaker gem in Uruthiru states that it might not have willingly retreated from humanity, and this is the gem that also reveals that the sibling might have something to do with the functions of Uruthiru. Malishi is also our only known historical bondsmith by name, and Malishi ain't the shining light of bondsmiths, to be honest. He had a plan to cut off the Parsh from their connection to Voidlight, which at this time was being given to them by Bo Ado Mishram, one of the Unmade. They intended to capture him in a similar way that Dalinar was able to capture that Unmade in the end of Oathbringer. There were some voices of concern on some of the potential side effects of this, but they went through with it anyway. While it is unknown, this is potentially the basis for the false desolation, and we also know that this is what damaged the Parsh and forced them into their slave form. So Malaysia just lobotomized like a whole race of people by accident. That's a pretty bad situation to be in as a bondsmith meaning to unite people and not rip them apart. I have a friend who has floated the idea that Malishi's bond was with the sibling and after doing this horrible atrocity, Malishi broke his oaths in the worst possible way by committing suicide and by breaking your oaths, you turn your spren into a dead eyes. And so while the sibling isn't completely dead, he is still transformed into a weaker state. This would make sense with why the functions of Uruthiru kind of work but don't and it also lines up with why he has retreated from society potentially unwillingly. Kind of a jump, kind of a stretch, but I really like it. I love me my spicy hot takes. We know that Dalinar has some level of power that even the Stormfather is surprised by, and I'm really interested to see what these paths going forward are going to be. So there you have it. 10 orders, 10 heralds, 10 searches. We got through it. Took a little while, but here we are. Hopefully you learned some stuff in this video. Hopefully I hit you with some cool things to think about. And if I did, hit that like button. And if you haven't, hit that subscribe button and comment below. Tell me what your favorite order of the Knights Radiant are. I'm really excited for this project of breaking down the Stormlight Archive for people. And I can't wait for the next part. Please check it out next week. November is Brandon Sanderson's month. Thank you so much for watching and stay lit.